This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project. Sharing stories from five ports in Ireland and Wales. Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock. Project funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Welcome to the Port Stories podcast by Ports Past and Present, which is a European development project funded by the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. I'm Claire Nolan, I'm a researcher on the project, and today I'm talking to Betty Ash. Betty is a native of the Dockland community living on Pierce Street, and she's been a community activist for 50 years. Um, and Betty's come here today to talk to us a bit about her work and, um, and what the heritage of the Docklands means to her. So uh, welcome, Betty, and thanks for joining us today. And I suppose the first question really that we'd like to ask is, you know, just could you tell us a little bit about your work and role in Dublin Docklands over the years? Well, thank you for the very nice introduction, Claire. <laughs> uh, it, it, it captures me in a couple of words, living mm. in Pier Street all my life and a community activist. Now, my community activism started when I, my kids went to school and I got a, involved in the school activities and then graduated on up to um, being involved in youth work and then gradually then more general um, community activities and then the um, getting into social partnership, uh, the Dublin Inner City Partnership playing a role in that. Then moving into um, the D Dublin Docklands Development Authority, which brings me right into the heart of work in the Docklands and the regeneration. Um, I, I suppose growing up in Pear Street, we, it was a very, very densely populated community with very large families and a, a living in substandard conditions and um, Lots and lots of work, a very industrialised community, Docklands, uh, the gas company manufacturing gas, the Hammond Lane foundry, and so on, so on, the bottle house, and um, plenty of work, unskilled work, low grade pay. Mm. Uh, so um, that all changed in the early 60s uh, when two of the tenements fell in Fenian Street and two little girls were killed who just made their first communion. They lived around the corner in Hollis Street and where, where they were killed was just a stone's throw from where they lived. So that brought the changes to my community. And um, the Dublin Corporation at the time came into the area and demolished all the substandard housing and depopulated the area. All the families were moved out and people say, where did they go? They went everywhere, you name it, anywhere. They were shifted anywhere, which left it with us with a very, very small community. And a high percentage of that community were older people. So those of us who were still living in the community and didn't have to move out, um, we all got together and um, decided to fight back, find ways that we could improve our um, community life because it, it was really you now the morale was very, very low out of the depopulation. But apart from that, simultaneously, technology was starting to kick in and uh, all the industry was moving out, out to the outer, the suburbs. And um, we had a lot of dereliction between the houses, the substandard housing gone, companies moving out, docklands in on my side, and I suppose on the other side of the river too, the same, same things were happening. It uh, was dereliction and no-go area, nothing mm -hmm. happening. Now, the port was more over to uh, on the um, north side and there was very little activity. There was no activity on our side, as had been previously with the boats coming in. Oh. So uh, 
it, it was really a, a very, very demoralizing time. And the economy was very, very poor because people were being um, sacked, said they were being, um, what's the word you use? Uh, well, let go, let go. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, um, this was going on and on and on, their election, no work, people couldn't get jobs. And um, we decided through, um, it, it emanated from the church that we set up Western Row City Key Social Service Council right. and looked at ways that we could start to um, bring life back into the community, give people a sense of identity and a pride in their identity. Mm. So uh, we started off very simple. At that time in the, in the 60s and early 70s, there was no money about uh, available for any sort of building an infrastructure of community development. And, um, but we had, we got funding for a social worker and for a project worker. So they were working, encouraging people to get involved and to look at ways we could build the community up and strengthen the community. So um, we were, there was a number of us, mainly women now, mainly mm -hmm. mothers and kids who wanted so better for the kids and wanted to break that intergener uh, inter intergenerational lack of education. Mm. So um, grinds were set up for the kids, students in Trinity would give grinds for the kids. So that was great, that was the start. We also had a, 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 a service for our seniors because of we had quite a lot of people. Now, they wouldn't have been old in terms of today, but mm. in terms at that time, you know, if you were in your mid 50s, early 60s, you were considered to be older. Now, now you, uh, it's, it mean we're still working into our 80s. Yeah. So mm. um, it was a totally different time. And because all the family support had moved away, we had to provide services to those who needed it. Mm. So eventually we were in premises from Western Row, Western Row from Trinity. And because of all the kids were moved out of the area, the Boys National School on Pierce Street was no longer required as a school. So um, the group of us that were active uh, applied to the diocese who owned the school building to uh, lease it as, and develop a community resource centre. And we were successful. So we moved into that building and then we looked around and said, what are we going to do with this building? <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we did was bring the day centre that was in Western Row down, the seniors down, and the grinds. And uh, we looked and said, well, we had a bit of a uh, session say, well, what, what, what do we need to address first? because our objective was to build a one-stop shop, develop a one-stop shop where all services that were needed to, for the community could be under the one roof. So that was really groundbreaking stuff at the time. So uh, when we moved into the building, FOST were there, they came in and helped us um, do the building up with a community youth training program, training young people in skills of construction. And uh, they did a good job at, for the building. And um, then we started to access programs from FOSS, like CE programs and uh, other, other programs that were available at the time. We jumped on anything that was available. We had a, 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 a program that People, we took on young people and they researched for a history of the area. So that was one way. It was, there was always something of interest, you know. And then we, uh, one of our first activities was to um, uh, have a festival, an annual festival, for people to celebrate their identity. So that took off and was running up before uh, lockdown, it was in its 33rd year. 
And at first it was hard to get people out and try and, but we kept at it and at it and at it. And now it's, it's expected, you know, where, well, well, what's happening in the festival? Are we having a ball? Are we having this? Are we having that? You know, so, uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll get back up again running this year in a small way. Yeah. With yeah. the festival. But moving on then from St. Andrews and, um, we, that's when we became St. Andrews Resource Centre when we moved into the building. But moving on from that, we were also moving out into the community, outside the community, to see what was happening, what was going on. And at that time, the so social partnerships were set up, uh, a policy to set up social partnerships, um, you know, Bertie Hearn. And uh, as a, fa a fallout from that social partnership, concept there was local partnerships set up and funding was available so I was on that partnership and there for representing my community to, uh, to put forward any investment we needed so uh, and learning to sit at a table with the suits as we used to call them we don't <laughs> call it that now of course but that's the suits like agencies that were involved in running the city Mm. and learning how to do your business and put your case forward, articulate your needs and bring your um, problems and look for solutions and look for investment. So that was a great learning ground. Mm. Done mm. that for seven years. So then when at the time we were still derelict, uh, the Docklands was still derelict and... Um, Rudy Quinn came up with the idea of encouraging investment in Stockland. So um, set up a, a working committee to look and consult. And as a result of that, Dublin Docklands Development Authority set up to regenerate Docklands, north and south of the river. Nice. So myself and my friend and colleague, Dolores Wilson, who was also very active with me and many others, um, we were nominated to represent our community on the Docklands Council, which was supposed to have a life 15 years, three, five years lifestyle, lifetime. But it went on longer anyway. But we were nominated for those 15 years. So it was, there was continuity. Now, there were seven, seven representatives, community reps on the Docklands Development Authority and uh, bringing their needs to the table and, um, uh, you know, able to articulate what the needs were and um, make, make our cases. And there was great investment in community infrastructure. There was um, educational programs for our kids, encouraging them to stay on and do Leaving Cert. And um, there was scholarships to help them go into third level. So it, it was, it, the Docklands was groundbreaking stuff in this, in this state from the start at the beginning of this state. It was groundbreaking mm. because community people had a voice, a strong voice, because there were seven of us, a council of 25, there were seven of us representing communities, plus there was five city councillors on the council as well. So we had a strong lobby mm -hmm. for the community. And um, myself and Dolores, we fought hard for um, to get social housing for our people mm -hmm. and to make sure our people took part in anything that was available. The uh, scholarship programs, the um, schools business placement programs. So we, we were all very, very proactive because we weren't, we were a smaller community and it was easier, it, was, it wasn't easy, but gradually the trust was built up that we were there for to make a case for our community. So we were trusted to do that. Whereas on the other side of the river, there was a number of communities. There was North Wall, East Wall, Port Dwellers, Sheriff Street, and they, they didn't all work together. They all had their own different agendas all still in the interest of the communities, 
but they, they weren't one community. They were divided into like villages, whereas we were smaller and we were seen as representing Pier Street and City Quay. So we, we were able to be very proactive. And then when the, um, the DDDA took uh, over the gas company site, uh, we fought hard to ensure that our people got the social housing and the affordable housing where they could afford a mortgage. And that worked very well for us. And also we were making friends everywhere. We were, had our tentacles everywhere. We were engaged with the waterways, which affected Waterways Ireland, which affected us because the canals. And we engaged with Dublin Port because they were the river and the port. And uh, Trinity College being our neighbour. And uh, DCC uh, as managing the city. And um, so we engaged with all those groups and worked with them. And uh, we, we, we were able to, um, any, any, any changes, like when the, um, the port was in transition, we were able to be involved and in, you know, embrace the changes mm. and therefore have some influence. But if you don't embrace the changes and go with it, you let, get left behind. So we were very, very proactive in promoting um, one, one, if the whole of Docklands, while they might all have their own agendas, the corporate sector, the community sector, the public sector, but there would be cohesion with all of the groups, which would make Docklands a brand new quarter, really, the generation, uh, intergenerational stuff, we had to try and seek that cohesion that we weren't all operating separately. Uh, corporate sector out there uh, away from us and everyone operating individually, we needed to have cohesion so that we could have some kind of sustainability because we were the traditional community and everybody coming into the regeneration were brand new to the area. So it was important that we maintained and sustained the history of the area, the old with the new. Gosh, I mean, that's just, you know, uh, the, the amount of work accomplished and uh, just the shining example that you and the other women that you work together with provided um, or provided in this instance is it, it's um, it's quite overwhelming, actually, just to, you know, to hear all the work that you've done and and how, like you say, groundbreaking um, and life changing it must have been for people living in the area. You know, um, it also sounds like your community, particularly the Pierce Street area, was quite a unique community and a unique group of people that came together and a unique group of women essentially that came together um and I know we've talked about this in the past but you know I, I wonder is there something inherent in the community going back in time was there a tradition of strong women always in that community well I think when when the chips were down and we were on our knees that's when the women came to the fore. Before that, women just walked away quietly in the background, um, uh, bring the, may, trying to ensure that kids would have a be better, um, uh, have better opportunities. But it was only when the chips were really down mm -hmm. that we came into our own. And we knew then we had to go and get upskill and learn how to do things properly, how to, how we could, go forward and gain because the time you couldn't go shouting and bawling and banging tables we are getting not we want this we were protesting we never had uh, a history of protesting mm. we we always tried to deal uh, with a manner in a proper manner yeah so yeah. that's when the women on this side now the women in the northern city docklands they were very very strong women but a lot, there was a lot, there was a sign that sort of a, very much a kind of a left wing mm. approach to things on the northerner city. 
Mm-hmm. And they, they were very interested in changing policy. Well, we were different. We were more uh, action oriented and looking for what was needed and providing services. Right. So yeah. we had different approaches. But uh, the women in the North Inner City were very, very strong women. Mm-hmm. Uh, it took us a while to come into our own. Purely survival for survival. That's what, that's what brought us into our own was the passion to survive. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I, it's just, it's an amazing story. And, you know, the fact that the legacy of it still continues now as well as a testament to all the work that you've done. So in terms of um, your connection to the heritage of the Docklands area, um, can you tell me, are, which, are there any particular sites um, or stories about um, the Docklands that are important to you? Well, I suppose uh, trying to um, preserve the history of the Docklands uh, and, uh, and all that it meant to our Dockland communities because it provided uh, employment. Mm-hmm. Port and pro- provided employment, the gas company, hundreds of local and people lived and worked locally. Mm-hmm. They worked mm-hmm. where they lived. So like the gas company um, with manufacturing gas, the hooter would go at half 12 and hundreds of men would pile out and go home for their dinner. Now, that was at half 12. You had to have the dinner on the table. Mm. So it meant that there was no fridges. It was a daily chore to get the shopping, the dinner, you know, the stuff in for food every day. Yes. There was no big weekly shops in the big supermarkets. <laughs> it was a, a daily chore. And, um, and, and at that time, like working in the likes of the gas company, they weren't clothes that you rinsed and hung up and dried in, a, in an hour or two. They were heavy duty stuff. And there was no washing machines. So women really had it tough. The last generation of women before me had it really, really tough and living in very overcrowded conditions. Mm. So it was very hard. But the women just slogged along day to day, day to day. And that's what kept the fabric of the community together. Right. The men went out and did their job, but that's what they did. They did their job. But Mm. the women did everything else. Yeah, they maintained and strengthened the fabric of the community and the family. Yeah, and it sounds like that work continues on today through the work that you've done. And um, and you, do you think that maybe those women um, in the past didn't get enough recognition? Well, I suppose they didn't. It wasn't the thing to look for recognition. You soon be put back in your box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever you were handed out, yeah, yeah, whatever deal you were handed, that's it. You had to work with it. Um, do you feel that they've had recognition since? Oh, I think women now demand uh, recognition. Not so much. Uh, I'm not talking about the uh, like pride in what they do or anything, but recognition for how important the work they're doing is to uh, society. And yeah. to the younger generations, that women can stand up and be counted and matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But maybe those women in the Docklands and in, in days gone by <clears throat> haven't really had their, you know, the work that they did is probably hasn't been recognised maybe in the way that it should have been. Well, because it was co- sort of intangible, really. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right now, everything is more visible. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's much more visible and uh, the quality of life now gives people confidence to stand up and be counted. Yes. You know, yeah. the quality of life, uh, people are, are upskilling and, and uh, uh, providing opportunities mm-hmm. for those coming behind, encouraging and nurturing the people coming behind, the younger people coming behind. I mean, my time uh, and my group of people, um, when we uh, were involved in building up the community, our time is finished now. Mm -hmm. We've achieved what we set out to do. 
So there are different challenges now. Mm. And our people are more prepared for new challenges and facing up to new challenges. Yes. But the challenges we faced are no longer there. We mm. have survived. We have a good quality of life. We have opportunities. So it's a totally different world for the next generation after us. We, they were given the opportunities and they grabbed them. Yeah. So you got, you, you basically helped to lay the foundations for, for these, for this new generation to, to come into their own, essentially. Yes. Um, yes. It's what a, what a legacy and what an achievement, you know, and, and also a kind of, um, from my perspective, it certainly, it, it, it holds up the Docklands um, in terms of social history and activism um, as as an example for everybody, really, that, you know, um, should maybe be used to encourage um, other communities to 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 stand together in, in the same kind of way. Well, there are many, many people in within their own communities in Docklands who are very strong. But one of the one of the. Um, uh, strengths, I suppose, in the north inner city was they were very much um, uh, involved in the unions. It, that, that wasn't a tradition over here. Okay. So they always had that sort of um, fighting for rights, for human rights, for women's rights, for all sorts of rights. We didn't have that tradition over here. Yeah, yeah. So there were different kind of different ways of, of um, making changes and making a difference in, in, in different places within the Docklands. But essentially all the communities were, like you say, fighting for survival, fighting yes. for better quality of life. And yeah. Different I, ways, different approaches, but all about communities, and commu families and rights for families, for women, for men, for everybody opportunities you know uh, so we were all doing it in different ways yeah 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 exactly well I think I think uh it's been amazing talking to you and I think what you know everything we've just talked about you know it's not um it's it's never gonna go out of date this kind of thing it's it's still like we were saying it's an example to other communities and um you know I think I think we can still learn a lot from all of the work that you've done so you can be very proud um, <laughs> of everything you've done. And um, I, I will, we'll probably bring it to a close now, but thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. Um, it's, been, it's been amazing. Well, I, I hope I've given a good, healthy picture of it anyway. <laughs> thank you, Betty. Okay, Claire. <laughs>